Today, we're very pleased to welcome to the FCC uh, Howard French to speak about encounters with China's migrants in Africa. Uh, as we can see, this is obviously a topic that is, uh, holds a lot of interest for uh, all of us uh, as Africa and China and their increasing links strengthen. Uh, Howard French comes to us with impeccable journalism credentials. Uh, he's worked with the New York Times, uh, been based in Shanghai, spent a lot of time in Africa, uh, worked for the Her International Herald Tribune, uh, and is currently uh, an associate professor at the Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism. Um, and Mr. French also is uh, an accomplished photographer and has a, a book appearing in August on disappearing Shanghai. But today we're going to talk about Africa, and I'm very pleased to welcome Mr. Howard French. Mr. French. Thank you very much, Timothy, and, and thank you, Anna, for, for putting together such a, a wonderful event. It's really great to be in Hong Kong and, and again, and it's great to be in this venue. And as you said, it's great to have had this kind of turnout given the um, recent weather uh, news, which we've all had to put up with one way or another. Um, I'm going to just talk for a few minutes <coughs> about my relationship to this subject, which um, uh, in some ways is deeply personal. I started out as a journalist in, in Africa um, immediately out of college and sort of discovered this vocation and spent the first six years of my time in this profession traveling around Africa as a freelance, well, most of that time as a freelance reporter. Um, uh, but more pertinently to, pertinently to today's subject, I want to talk about how I came to perceive this subject, the subject of China's relationship with the African continent as, as uh, one of, of rapidly rising and tr truly momentous importance and how I went about pursuing it as a reporter, uh, culminating in an effort to write a book, which I've just completed um, and am anxiously, as some of you know, awaiting news from my editor to see how um, it's going to be, how it's being received. Um, I moved to China in 2003 as a correspondent for the, for the New York Times. I was the Shanghai bureau chief uh, and ended up staying there for five years. And while in Shanghai, I became gradually, or, or I should say while in China, most of my work was not in Shanghai, even though I lived there. Um, while in China, I sort of gradually came, began to perceive this, uh, the beginnings of uh, a, a big push of Chinese engagement with the African continent, primarily in, in uh, economic terms, but also a, with a political dimension. We've just in the last couple of weeks had the latest uh, installation of, or installment of, uh, of an event that took place for the first time when I was in Hong China, in Shanghai in 2000, I think it was 2003 or four, the first incarnation of this event, but that is FOCAC, which is become a sort of ritualized meeting between the head, the Chinese head of state and a gathering of many Chinese, I'm sorry, of many African leaders who um, are flown to China and greeted with great pomp and circumstance um, in an event which in its, according to the this ritual, um, each, with each installment, ever larger numbers of aid and investment and lending are announced from, from China to the continent. Um, but in 2005, I received the visit of the foreign editor of the New York Times. And in the, according to a very different ritual of the New York Times, when a correspondent is in a region and the foreign editor decides to visit you, one of the things you have to do, I mean, you, you go through this awkward, uh, sometimes nerve-wracking moment or, or, or passage where you have to sort of hold hands with the editor for a few days while they're in your turf. And one of the things that you do to fill the time typically is to take the editor around to see interesting and important people. And so that was my task during the visit of the foreign editor. And I ended up taking, we ended up coming to Beijing naturally, and we had a number of visits with people in civil society, but also with people in government. And one of these meetings was with a very senior foreign ministry official who we had a wide ranging discussion with. Um, and at the end of that discussion, um, uh, I sort of sat back and let the, edit, let the editor do her thing. And um, at the end of the discussion, it sort of dawned on me almost at the last minute that Africa had not entered into the conversation. And I said, without any sort of premeditation, I said to the, to the 
uh, foreign minister, I'm sorry, the assistant foreign minister or deputy foreign minister, I asked him, how did China justify its embrace of Sudan at a time in 2005 when uh, the crisis in Darfur was being widely spoken of as a genocide or as a possible case of genocide? And the, for the deputy foreign minister sort of turned his gaze to me um, and answered without missing a beat that business is business, um, which I went on to write and quote, and this became a very famous quote, but that's really not the point I'm trying to make. What, what this did for me was really sort of galvanize my interest in looking at these relations. This, I'm going to, for convenience sake, I'm going to call it a relationship between China and Africa, although you should all know that, that that's not really what it is. China is one country and Africa is 54 countries and there are lots of relationships, um, bilateral and multilateral, between China and Africa. And so for convenience, I'm going to call it a relationship, um, even though it's more, much more than that. But anyway, this sort of clinched my interest in looking very carefully at the relationship. And I, I was fortunate to have the editor present to hear this language from the deputy foreign minister because the editor wasn't herself terribly predisposed to thinking of this as, as a subject of great importance. Um, at least that's how I perceived it. Um, so um, I went back to Shanghai, the editor went back to New York, and um, uh, I eventually, within a few months, proposed and uh, had approval for doing a series of pieces in the Times about China's relationship with Africa. And I went off and I visited a, a number of countries and in cooperation with a, a fellow correspondent, Lydia Polgreen, who is now in South Africa. And we did it together, we did a multi-part series on, 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 uh, on, on this subject, uh, as best we could, sort of covering it in, in as much breadth as possible. Um, f this was the beginning of the sort of rise of this topic in the, in the Western media, certainly, when uh, it seemed uh, uh, that the importance of this relationship was being widely recognized and everyone was trying to, it was gradually beginning to weigh in on it and trying to, 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 to say something interesting or to accord an importance to it. Um, I, I became frustrated as I watched the story emerge, so I, ha I had done my bit essentially. I wasn't going to do a second series, and everybody else is weighing in, and I'm in China writing about China now, and um, continued to do so for another three years after that series. But as I watched the other sort of the emerging coverage of this topic, I became aware of and increasingly frustrated with uh, uh, some of the sort of tendencies that became, I think, rather fixed or set uh, in terms of thinking about and portraying. China's relationship with the continent. And the first of them I would describe as kind of a, a, a figures or numbers based economic story where uh, every time a, a, a publication decides to write about this, what they're essentially doing is rolling out ever bigger numbers that are, that are without much other context or analysis are meant to sort of conveys the, 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 that something really important is happening here. And as you, any of you, and I assume most of you are involved with China news in one way or another, as all of you know, with China, num playing with numbers is an easy thing to do. It's a very natural thing to do. That, you know, China can over, China and Chinese, the Chinese economy, obviously the Chinese population, China as a subject is, a, is something that lends itself to sort of rolling out the numbers. And so one type of this Africa-China coverage that I saw, which I found very unsatisfying, was precisely that, where, okay, this year it's 8 billion, next year it's 25 billion, the year after that it's 64 billion, now it's 182 billion, next thing you know it's gonna be 6.10 trillion, I'm making this up, right? But, but, but that was the nature of it, um, and I find that very empty. Um, the second sort of broad trend had kind of two rival components to it, and this other trend was looking at the relationship uh, in terms of a putative contest between China and the West for Africa, as if Africa were a prize to be won or was um, uh, a property in dispute. Um, and I say there were two components to this coverage because the people who wrote, and many people wrote in this vein, the people who wrote in this vein tended to do so in one or another of two ways. 
the first way being that China was portrayed as a predator nation, that it was preying on Africa, that it was recolonizing Africa, that it was taking something away from Africa, that sometimes uh, going, people went so far as to suggest that it was raping Africa. Um, and the other sort of rival school in this uh, way of thinking about the subject was that China is uh, virtually a savior of Africa, that China is this benevolent, you know, deep-pocketed um, suitor that has arrived on the scene and is going to, um, you know, bestow its generosity on Africa and begin to do all of these great things for the continent that the stingy others of the world, notably Europe and the West in general, had so uh, clearly, according to this view, not done. Um, what struck me as most, uh, well, interesting about this unsatisfying way of thinking about the continent, and there were many things that were unsatisfying about it, but most interesting was, whichever of those two schools one considered, the voices of Africans were really argue, uh, absent from the picture. In other words, so in the first, the China as predator story, it was Westerners speaking about what a shame it is, what the Chinese are doing for Africa. And with the China as savior story, it was um, Chinese voices or voices sympathetic to, to China's position in the world, essentially touting you know, China's contributions to Africa. And very rarely, almost never in fact, were African analyses incorporated into, in, into these uh, uh, pictures. Um, they were, we, the reader was being asked to accept them sort of on their own terms. Um, and, and so this got me thinking about the need to reapproach this subject. Um, and I went in 2009, uh, after I had left the New York Times, I, I, I changed jobs in 2008 to after 23 years at the Times to, to begin teaching at Columbia University and uh, uh, very quickly sort of got thinking about this topic again and proposed a story for Atlantic Magazine which accepted my idea and sent me off um, and um, I spent several weeks reporting in Eastern and Southern Africa and came back uh, sort of more charged up even than before about what was missing in this story. And so not only, the, I, I, in addition to what, I had, what I've just described about the African voices that were missing, another piece that sort of occurred to me that was really missing was um, that the actual Chinese players themselves were missing from the story. In other words, so whichever of these two accounts one tended to consume, believe, or trust, um, the forces were these sort of giant anonymous distant forces in play and they were faceless and they didn't have there were not names or human beings associated with them from the western china as predator well either actually from both of these perspectives um, it was either the chinese state with a plot to take over africa or it was the, the chinese state with a plot to do good things for africa um, and there were no inter intermediaries there were there was there was no there was no face, like, to repeat myself, to the Chinese presence on the ground. And so as I traveled, <coughs> excuse me, as I traveled for this Atlantic piece, um, I began for the first time, well, not actually for the Times piece, I saw a bit of this, but what was impressive was between 2006 and 2009, the, when I did the Times series and, the, and the, the Atlantic piece, was the increased presence, at least I noticed in an anecdotal kind of way, uh, on the ground of Chinese people. And so I became impressed not just by the absence of the Chinese voices, but this immense growth in the presence of or, what struck me as ordinary Chinese people. These were not you know, um, senior officials or bureaucrats. These were farmers or business people, um, uh, small and medium-sized investors, miners, um, industrialists of one kind or another, et cetera, et cetera. And so, I was seized with the idea of trying to understand the Chinese relationship with Africa through these two bodies, the body of African, uh, the African uh, public opinion and um, the minds and lives of African peoples on the ground as they interact with Chinese people and with the Chinese people themselves who are on the ground in Africa. 
Um, I wrote the Atlantic piece. There was a very good reaction to it. Um, I was approached by a publisher, a very good publisher, that offered me a contract very quickly to write a book about this. And then something almost miraculous happened, and that is that um, Open Society approached me around the same time, and they were interested in having me become a fellow, and I was very lucky to have been granted a fellowship, which, and I'm, I, I, my Open Society friends are here. So, so this might be perceived wrongly as me sort of kissing up to them, but I, I can say in all sincerity that what I have been able to do with in this sort of effort has wouldn't simply not have been possible otherwise. Open Society, through this fellowship, sort of made it possible for me to travel really extensively, um, to, 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 to really sort of wear my shoes out on the ground over a very long period of time, seven months in all on the road over the last year and a half um, in Africa to go after these two things, the African sort of society and the Chinese, uh, this new Chinese presence. And so that's what I did. I made three trips to the continent beginning in the fall of 2010 um, and um, just ran after this story as much as I could. Um, I, um, you know, I, I had lived in China for five years and I had always been impressed by Chinese people. To, and I caution my students not to speak in generalizations like this but I'm about to commit one myself. Um, I had always been impressed by Chinese people as being in China, as being very, very approachable. As a journalist in China, paradoxically perhaps, um, it had never seemed hard for me to talk to people. Chinese people were, you, you barely had to scratch them and they would tell you what they think about almost anything and to do so at great length and with great energy most of the time. But somehow I had convinced myself that it would become, that it was going to be much more difficult on the ground in Africa to get Chinese people to open up to me and to tell me their stories and to sort of really tell me the lowdown on how they got there and what their lives consisted of and what their relationships were in, with Africans in their surroundings. And, and importantly, what their feelings were about where they had come from, what their own country, um, its future, et cetera. Um, maybe I had gotten sort of psyched out about this because so little of the coverage, almost none of the coverage that I had read up until that point, and I had tried to read everything, actually had Chinese voices in it. And so I had maybe convinced myself that you know this was because people had tried. Um, and they had found that it was impossible to get Chinese people to talk to them. I'm afraid that's probably not what happened. I think, um, in fact, in light of my own experience, that people did not try, that people committed a real cardinal sin of journalism, and that is not going after all of the pertinent actors to a particular situation. So I got to Ethiopia, which was the first stop on my trip, in November, late November 2010, and arrived, it was a night flight, a very long flight, and um, via Amsterdam, and I got in exhausted and, you know, um, landed in my hotel room and I'd got this long list of contacts. I, I didn't talk about how I had my work method, but I had spent the summer in Shanghai, previous summer in Shanghai, on my own time, not on my fellowship time, sort of building contacts among Chinese people that I could find in Africa and sort of working personal networks and getting names of people in various countries. and then using those names to sort of generate other names. And so as I developed a list of countries, I had, you know, typically a dozen or maybe as many as 20 names of people who I had found on the ground in China or via friends in China. And so I arrived in, 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 um, in Ethiopia rather, I, I laugh at myself as I think about this, um, nervously. Um, uh, thinking like, oh no, you know, I've got, I've, I've, I really have to make this trip work. I've only got a little bit limited amount of time, you know, because I've never read a quote from a Chinese person in Africa hardly. They're, I'm anticipating it's going to be really difficult to get people to talk to me. I make the phone call to the first guy on my list, and it was literally, I just did it in order. It was like the first guy. So I called him, and uh, his, his name was Zhang Yu, and um, he said um, to me very excitedly, I've been waiting for you to come. I'm like, I mean, that was, you can't imagine how that sounded as a journalist. Someone, <laughs> someone, is, someone important is for, for, for my purposes was waiting for me to come. He says, when can I pick you up? 
which was another incredible sentence. And I said, well, you know, I didn't actually have a schedule. <laughs> so as early as you can come tomorrow. He said, great, I'll come and pick you up tomorrow morning, first thing. And so that's what he did. He, took, he picked me up um, in his pickup truck with his girlfriend who had just recently arrived from China. And he, this man was a farmer who had been, as was true with many, many of the subjects that I ended up meeting, had been, um, uh, you know, uh, a sort of lower middle class, not a failure in life by any means, but didn't see much upside for himself uh, kicking around in Honan province, which is where he was from. And, you know, had gotten word through his own networks that, that, there, that you know, Africa was a place of opportunity uh, where money could be made, where there were things to be built, and where um, in this, this particular country, in particular Ethiopia, where the reputation in China was that people were friendly to Chinese people. Um, and so he took all of his savings and uh, <coughs> pulled out of it. He had a used a, a, a business fixing and selling used cars. And he, so he sold his, that business and moved to Ethiopia and, and started a business um, uh, uh, selling produce in the city and eventually made enough money so he could buy some, some land. In, and so I spent the next few days with him visiting all the vendors that he dealt with, the local Ethiopian vendors who were his customers in wet markets all over Addis Ababa, Addis Ababa and then traveling to his farm eventually. And so he was building, and I'm just, I'm, for time reasons, I'm not gonna tell a whole lot of these stories, but there are a lot of sort of features in his story that in general terms became common themes to many of the people I met. So he becomes successful. What does a successful Chinese migrant to Africa do? A successful Chinese migrant to Africa begins bringing their own immediate people to the environment that they live in. And so he, first he brought his mother. His mother was separated from his father and living alone. And she had told him these stories about how unbearable it was to be alone. On, during the spring festival, he was her only child. And so he brought his mother, you know, in late 60s to early 70s, brings her to Ethiopia, first time she'd ever been on an airplane, um, and sets her up initially on the farm, and then he builds a little highway, sort of roadside motel, and lets her run the motel. Next thing he brings his girlfriend, next thing he brings cousins, next thing, and so these, through these personal networks, word is spreading throughout um, Hunan, where he's from, that, you know, this place, Ethiopia, is really kicking, you know, you can make a lot of money there. <laughs> Um, and so Ethiopia, so Chinese people from his own little universe are flowing into Ethiopia. Well, this is the process that has been multiplied all over Africa in the last decade. The numbers that are spoken of are that there are a million Chinese people who have moved to, to Africa um, in, in the last 10 years or so. And these numbers are really crude guesstimates that are not based on any serious statistical work. Uh, I said, as I've told some in this audience previously, that I think I credit them because just I credit them as roughly as reasonable because of what I've seen on the ground. Uh, you know, cities that have populations of tens of thousands of Chinese people in many countries, um, and there's lots of countries in Africa, so you multiply that out, and a million as a ballpark figure becomes a plausible number. Um, in the interest of time, I'll just say that Huang Yu's story was not uh, Zhang Yu's story was not um, typical in the sense that most of these million people didn't come because they they sold their private business and decided to, that there was money to be made in Africa, pulled up their roots and moved on their own. Most of these people moved because they came to Africa on big state projects. They were construction workers, typically, building highways or ports or stadiums or things like that, that the Chinese state, through its provincial governments, is very and provincial state companies are very busy doing. <coughs> And they arrive in Africa and they discover that, uh, contrary to what they may have heard, Africa is reasonably friendly, much more prosperous in some cases than they had thought, uh, that there's tons of opportunity, and that you know, they have more room and more personal freedom than they had in China. And so they decide, many of them decide to stay on. And then they begin to generate this emulation effect by talking back home to their personal network. And this brings, draws newcomers who are drawn by the fact that they have created this foothold um, in, on the continent. I'll just say finally that I, mean, I would have been happy that I had chosen this subject anyway because of the rich 
ness of the personal stories. And I haven't spoken to the African side of this um, uh, here for time purposes, but I get into that extensively in my book. I would have been happy with the subject simply on the basis of the richness of the personal stories that I came across. But I think that there's something much more important to this and that makes me doubly happy to have um, worked on this topic. And that is that I think that um, the most, I have come to believe that the most important aspect of China's relationship with Africa is this movement of peoples. That the Chinese state has its own policies and we had a little debate yesterday in our conference about how coordinated and centralized those policies are and you know, reasonable people can disagree. But I think however coordinated and centralized these policies are, they are being outstripped by another factor, and that is this human factor of the large scale movements of people who come in the ways I've described, who build out their own networks, who are thereby creating these feedback loops uh, of trade, commerce, human relations, culture, um, sometimes intermarriage, et cetera, et cetera, between China and Africa that are going to, over time, I think, become much more important than uh, the state-to-state -state relations and will uh, frustrate, uh, in some cases, um, Beijing's efforts to define China, its policy uh, toward Africa in general and toward specific, specific countries in particular because the perception of China will be shaped in those countries by the, the place that those Chinese communities begin to assume in these countries and by the relationships that the people in those communities are able to build good or bad in those places. Um, and that the Chinese state will not simply not be able to control all of that. Um, I alluded yesterday to um, some analogous history that I, that I found in my research along the way that I think is is very interesting and very pertinent, and that is the history of, of Portuguese settlement in East, southeastern Africa beginning in the 15th century. You had a phenomenon of people called um, transfrontier men, who were people that, the Port Portugal is a very small country that didn't have, can't pop, you know, export millions of people like China did, and so what they did strategically was export small numbers of people, very often prisoners, very often low-level people of the society who they offered honors and titles and even priesthood with, which was another form of, of title and honor in Portuguese society at that time, if they would go settle in these new Portuguese possessions with which the Portuguese state didn't have the manpower or wherewithal to, to staff up and to control in a, in a more richly, sort of densely populated fashion. And these people began to define the relationship between Portugal and, and places like Mozambique in much more than the Portuguese state ever, ever was able to. And so I think that this is a very powerful analogy to what's happening in Africa, that, that these Chinese communities are going to be the driving force in determining these relationships, but on a much bigger scale because the numbers that China can generate are vastly greater than what Portugal or even what all of Europe was ever able to do. I'll stop there and we'll take some questions. Howard, thank you very much. Uh, we're now going to, we've got about 15 minutes for questions. Um, the way this works for any of you who haven't been here before is if you raise your hand, somebody will come to you with a microphone or just speak very loudly. And uh, please also, when you get, when you ask your question, if you could also identify yourself and state your affiliation. So first of all, Marty down in the front. Yes, uh, Martin Mertz, no affiliation other than membership of the club. Um, the flip side of the coin is Chinese, uh, African movement towards China. I recently heard that there's some 200,000 Africans living in Guangzhou. Is, does that play a role in your uh, big picture? This is not some, I mean, I'm aware of this, and I've, at, when I was with the Times, I wrote a bit about this, so, but that would have been several years ago. Um, uh, it's not a focus of, my, of this work that I've described. I think it's important, though, in the sense that how those people are treated will affect how Africa's image in a uh, China's image in Africa. Uh, for example, um, seven or eight weeks ago, there was a big crackdown against Nigerians, who are the, probably the largest single group in Guangzhou. Um, and according to what I heard, um, a, a number of the people were treated very roughly. You know, there were like police. 
I think someone died in police custody. Yes. So there were these big waves of arrests, and as you said, some died in police custody. Well, so this became huge news in Nigeria, where I was last month, and people were still talking about it. And the Nigerians, because of public uh, opinion pressure from public opinion, began to stop issuing visas to Chinese people who want to go to to Nigeria or to extend their stay in Nigeria. Um, and so that's just a very simple illustration of uh, of how how Chinese people treat Africans is going to determine how Africans perceive Chinese people. That it's not all about building stadiums and you know um, announcing big loan packages. Some I was uh, somebody who traveled with me for this event from Africa was given a difficult time at the airport here, and this is a person of great distinction who, you know, was coming for purely legitimate reasons, and can only, one can only think that she was stopped because she was African, um, and you know, to the extent that that's the perception that Africans have of the way Chinese regard them, it's going to be a problem for China's relationship with Africa. Uh. Everyone, table number two. Um, I'm To Han Shi, a reporter from the South China Morning Post. Just two questions from Mr. French. One is that you've already said that uh, the presence of significant growing numbers of Chinese in Africa is going to be a very important force determining China-African relations, and you've sort of explained. You have explained to some extent why this is so, but can you explain more in detail of why it's so important? My second question is, do you think the Chinese government is um, changing and taking certain measures to mitigate any negative or controversial aspects of um, China-African relations, such as, for example, complaints that Chinese businessmen are taking away business from local Africans? Um, so it becomes important, this, the, the, this, these communities become important, just to elaborate a little bit. Because if uh, once they set themselves up on the ground, they, they largely escape, and in some cases wholly escape, control from the Chinese government. The Chinese state is no longer, uh, you know, they, they are not in the jurisdiction of the Chinese state. They are subject to the local laws, and they can choose to wholly ignore um, whatever the Chinese um, embassy or, or diplomats <coughs> Um, tell them to do. Um, and in fact, that's the typical pattern. The, the ignoring takes place in both directions, by the way. The, the Chinese embassies in most places try to pretend that the Chinese communities don't exist, and vice versa. The Chinese communities regard the embassies with suspicion, and the Chinese embassies regard the Chinese communities as headaches. Like, these are you know, these are not the kind of Chinese that we're trying to promote as part of our image. You know, we're trying to the Chinese state is trying to sell the kind of story that I described at the beginning of my presentation, which is the story of big numbers. Okay, so we built a new set of government ministries, and last year and the year before that, we built a big stadium, and the year after this, we're going to build a new hospital, blah, blah, blah. That's, and, you know, we're creating X number of jobs. That's, those sorts of stories are the kinds of stories that the Chinese state seems most intent on promoting, not the story, the much messier story of how all of these Chinese people got into a little place for like a country like Mozambique, I'm sorry, Namibia, which is one of Africa's, population-wise, one of Africa's smaller countries, smallest countries, where there's probably, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm, I shouldn't offer figures, but there's probably two million people in Namibia, and there's perhaps 30, 40, maybe 50,000 Chinese people there already, um, and the Chinese Embassy, the Chinese, which is a surrogate for the Chinese state, doesn't really have a expl good explanation for how that came about, and certainly has no solution for moderating the flow of Chinese people there. And so the, what they do basically is put their head in the sand and try to pretend like, what, Chinese people? We didn't see them. Um, um, why this is an important relationship, just to come back to your question, though, is because what ha how those people behave is going to be the principal association that Namibians may have for China. It won't be the, the press announcements of the embassy. It won't be what happens at the FOCAC summit. It's going to be the Chinese people that they see in their midst. In the case of Namibia, for example, um, Chinese one of the businesses that Chinese people began to really get involved in a couple of years ago was hair salons. Now, just think about that. 
Chinese hair and African hair don't bear many notable similarities. Um, and, and hair salons are a, you know, a sort of entry-level business par excellence for poor people. It's like you didn't have much school, you wanted to sort of get into the money economy, you're a woman in particular, a hair salon's kind of one of, the, and you live in an urban environment. A hair salon's one of the most ob obvious things that are available to you just to just make a go of it. And next thing you know, there's 10 Chinese hair shops, you know, in your neighborhood. Um, that's for, if you're the Namibian woman who thinks this is her future, that's gonna be a big, big, big problem. What does the Chinese state do about that? How, what, you know, what's their recourse in that circumstance? Um, but the invasion, and I use that word, I'm not happy with that word, because I don't, I don't, uh, anyway. The, 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 the occupation of, the, the filling of this sort of niche by Chinese people um, is, will be for a certain segment of that po the Namibian population, the sort of, that that's China to them. Um, that defines the relationship. And for many of those people, Chinese, the official China pretends that to the extent that China enjoys a negative opinion at all in Africa, it's because the Western press created the opinion. That the Western press went around writing all of these things about China and Africa, therefore the Africans have these bad ideas about China or these myths, I'm sorry, about, yes, about China or these myths about China. That's troubling on a number of levels. First of all, it's not simply not true. But it's insulting. It's as if, like, so Africans don't have the capacity to figure out how they feel about something on their own. They need to take the lead from the Western press. As a New York Times writer, I never had the impression that a lot of Africans were reading the New York Times or my stories to begin with. Um, but it's in these sorts of ways, in the real world, on the ground, that China's image is being built. And so uh, that's why I like the hairdresser um, example. Table five. Howard, I'm Gina Huddle. I'm one of the banker members of the FCC, so basically a visitor watching the journalists in action. Wanted to ask you if you see any links, and it might be completely separate, and there may be no ties at all, but certainly we hear stories from our elder statesmen who have more time now than they did before uh, to tell us stories of before the war, during the war, after the war, when a lot of business left Shanghai and Beijing and Hong Kong and went down to Africa, sometimes wholly uh, represented by foreign um, members and citizens of these cities, um, often closely linked with the businesses with whom they were associated and working with during the war and hoping to go back to after the war. Is this wholly separate from what happened in the 40s and the 30s and the 50s? Uh, do you see ties? Do you see links? Or um, that was a one-off? So, you know, China has always been a people exporting nation. That's just a basic fact of China uh, because of uh, its large population, which is, it's, China's had a large population for a very long time. And in the past, feeding that population has been a big problem. And so Chinese has been a source of, China has been a source of great migration globally forever, virtually. Um, and, you know, Africa has been a destination for, for some of that migration for a long time. There's very old South Chinese communities in South Africa and Mozambique um, in Ethiopia, in Egypt, in various other places. Um, these, um, I, I, first of all, I didn't, I, just, I have to be honest, I didn't really, those communities were not of interest for me in my book. I didn't focus on them because I think that there's something really discreet taking place that is new and deserves to be described on its own terms, and that is this. Um, huge recent movement of people that is associated with and sim taking place simultaneous to the very deliberate state push to embrace Africa and more generally to encourage p Chinese people to choo choo to go out. Um, uh, and so I, it would have been a distraction I think for me to focus on these older communities which are there but ne were never really scaled up in, a, in any big way. I mean so the Chinese community in Mozambique is not big. Um, uh, if interesting, and to the extent that I looked at it, I, lo I looked at the way that the new Chinese and the old Chinese relate to each other. And in my experience, very little. That the, the old Chinese, the established Chinese communities, and this is, a, this is also a feature, regular feature that one sees with Chinese migration in various other parts of the world, including the United States, that the old established people look down on the newcomers. The newcomers are, you know, 
you know, they, everyone tells a good story about themselves. So the old people think that they were dignified and cultured and great and polished and, you know, bathed well and used deodorant and all the rest. And the newcomers are, you know, the opposite, right? I mean, that's a timeless thing. And it's happening in this latest wrinkle as well. We've got time for one more quick one over in the corner on table three. Robin Meredith from Bloomberg. Um, you've made an interesting distinction between the surge in population of Chinese going to Africa and the surge of money uh, from going from China to Africa. So aside from those individual stories you've told us, could you talk about the geopolitics of, of the latter, the surge in money? If embassies are, are sort of ignoring you know, Chinese who've migrated to Africa, you know, what are they focusing on? What is Beijing's intent if there is one unified intent you can generalize about? Sure, that's a very good question. I mean, I think that the, I don't, I don't think that there's a settled answer to how, the degree of sort of centralization and refinement of, the, of, of Beijing's policy, if you will. But I think that there is a, um, there are some salient features that can be described. And I think one of the most important is that China, beginning roughly a, a decade ago, began to be seized with the idea that, um, well, a few ideas that seem to work together. One of them is that China, um, f because of its rising power economically and its manufacturing-based economy, et cetera, et cetera, f sort of understood that it needed to control more, uh, to have greater control over access to natural resources, and that Africa was the most important sort of field of play for that kind of endeavor. And that at the, this coincided with a moment when Africa was, um, seemed to be relatively neglected by its traditional partners in the West. Um, and so China saw a sort of double opportunity in that sense and strategically focused, deci decided to focus on Africa as a place of great opportunity um, politically and economically. Um, the other piece that gets talked about less often, but I think is m equally interesting and maybe over the long term more important in terms of this sort of big picture of humanity, is that China saw Africa as a place uh, that in some ways was not so unlike China. In other words, China 50 years ago was a place of you know, great economic weakness, of social devastation, of all the rest, and that you know, Af Westerners look at Africa and see it that way and think, well, that's just the way they are. You know, we can't be, you know, too tied up in that because that's not going to get us anywhere. And China looked at that same picture and says, that's the way they are now, but that doesn't have to be the way they are forever. And if things begin moving there, then this becomes a great thing for us because, you know, those are markets. And these are fast growing markets, demographically and economically, and we need markets. China needed markets, and I think I began to understand this in a very sort of fine-tuned way, at least a decade ago. That so the West and Japan, demographically and debt-wise, are, are increasingly tired places. Uh, you know, they are saturated debt-wise, and they are fading demographically. And China needing customers says, so where are the customers? The customers are in Africa, potentially. And so China said, well, if we can work with that and make and help and be a catalyst in some way for, for the takeoff of these places as markets for us, then that would be a win-win. It's a phrase that I don't often think has great um, meaning to it, but in this sense, I think it has profound meaning to it. Um, and so China has been working, I think that has been at the center of its African focus for a very long time, that Africa is a place of great opportunity, um, demographically and economically, and we, China, need to be there because that's, you know, that's where the people are. I'll give you an example. So this African cities, Africa's urbanizing faster than any part of the world, any other part of the world right now. African cities will have three times as many inhabitants by 2050 as they have today. The city of Lagos in Nigeria has 18 million people now. By 2050, it will have close to 50 million people. Um, Kinshasa will be just slightly behind that. Uh, there will be another number of other cities uh, on uh, just uh, uh, one notch below that in Africa. 
Um, as we know from China's experience, urbanization is, a, is an economic phenomenon of incredible importance. It begins to introduce all sorts of new dynamics uh, you know, into people's lives. And China sort of, and the West sees this, uh, I mean, they, the New York Times had a series about their African dem demographics a few months ago, and it was all gloom and doom. It was all, and it was f focused on Nigeria, and it was like, the, you, the sort of unstated but very clear kind of message of it, these stupid Africans are really creating a mess for the world. Don't they know about birth control? I mean, that's the way, that, that was, that's sort of what the story, how it read to me, and I think to many, many people. Um, China and increasingly many Africans see this as a very different thing, that you know, Africa is hitting its demographic sweet spot, that there's a big dividend coming right now, and that it's not gonna pay off for everybody, but for the countries where it pays off, for the urban environments where this works out, there's gonna be incredible wealth created, and that you need to be involved in this, and this is a place where we, we wanna play, and we can, we can really make out. And so, you know, I, I think that this is a real central feature of the Chinese focus on Africa right now. Okay, well, thank you very much, Howard, for uh, enlightening us all. Uh, that's been uh, uh, great value for everybody. We never let anybody leave the FCC empty-handed, so on behalf of us, I'd like to present you with this small momentum. Thanks very much for your, your talk. Thank you.